This tutorial is going to be the first one of many to talk about how plane waves behave at interfaces. We have an interface and we have a plane wave defined by a, a wave vector which we'll name K and it's incident upon that interface. And this material has a refractive index which we'll call N1. And we're further going to define the angle that the wave vector makes with the interface to be an angle which we call theta 1. Okay, so this thing is going to refract at the interface. So there's going to be another wave vector. I won't draw it at the same angle. Here I've drawn it at a shallower angle. And we're going to define that with a letter also. We're going to call that wave vector Q. So Q is in the second material where the refractive index is N2. The refracted angle is theta 2. And let's just set up a coordinate system so we can be precise in language. We'll call this up direction the y direction and the horizontal direction in this picture x. So before we do any math at all, let's think about plane waves coming in towards an interface and plane waves leaving an interface. And let me show you a MATLAB simulation that just talks about the electric field animated at that interface. So I'm going to bring this over here. And let me run a little animation here. You see how these regions of light and dark are moving down the screen? So this is right at, this is, percent this is, this says x. This is at x equals zero, right along our boundary there. And, and this is the electric field strength animated as a function of time. So it's drifting downward like that. And the question is, what electric field could cause a situation like this to exist at the boundary? Now if I show you, instead of just the zero plane, I show you the incident wave, you can have a situation like this. You have a wave coming in at 45 degrees with a well-defined wavelength, and you'll notice that as it intersects the zero plane, you have alternating bands of light and dark. So this sort of wave sets up a situation like this at the boundary. And the question is, what sort of refracted wave can also meet that condition? And what I want you to see now is another... Here's another animation which just gives you some flavor of that. If I, as I animate this, you see an incident wave coming in at 45 degrees and a refracted wave traveling at some different angle. The wave vectors for these two waves are somewhat like the two that you see here. You see an incident wave at about 45 degrees and a refracted wave at a more gentle angle. And the thing that's important here, the bottom plot we'll talk about later in the course, is that these two waves have different wavelengths because the refractive indices N1 and N2 are different. And yet everything matches up nicely at the boundary. You can see that they both have the same rate at which something, I the electric field is changing strength as a function of time at the boundary. They stay knit together like that. And that's what you need to have in order to satisfy Maxwell's equations everywhere on this boundary at all times. Just to remind you again, the challenge is how to make the electric field behave like this on both sides of the boundary so that everything's always balanced. And the way to do that is to have these two waves angled exactly like this. You don't really have a choice about how they're going to behave. So with that said, let's do some mathematics of that. So we've got two plane waves here. We can start off by writing electric fields in the form of plane waves. We can say that electric field one, E1, Well, that's going to equal some E1 naught. Looks like a 10, but it's E1 naught. That's some constant vector. And then our standard propagation term, E to the I, K dot R, minus omega T. So that's what's happening on the left side. 
I'll remind us that there's a boundary here. And on the right side, we've got E2. Exact same form here. I'll just make that happen. So there's our expression. Notice that I've written e to the i q dot r minus omega t because I'm trying to compare the incident wave and the refracted wave. So I no longer write a k here. These two plane waves could both represent a wave traveling in space somewhere through all space. And as we've seen in the course, if you've got a plane wave propagating in air or glass, any sort of dielectric material, mathematically, these expressions will satisfy Maxwell's first equation, if I take the divergence of this electric field anywhere in space, I'm going to get zero. The divergence of this expression anywhere in space should be zero. This could be a plane wave traveling where there's no boundary. It's just in region N1 forever. Mathematically, that's what this means. Similarly, the divergence of E2 is also zero because this could be a plane wave traveling in space forever. Now, when I stitch these two waves together at the boundary, that's a different matter. But just right for right now, remember, these are simply plane waves like expressions in a single homogeneous medium like we've seen before. The divergence of each expression is zero. This will come up again in the next tutorial. So here I am at x equals zero. And I notice, what does the field look like at x equals zero? Well, if I plug in x equals zero for this dot product, and the, the vector only has x and y components, so there's no z component, that means that this expression over here goes as, I write tilde for goes as, it goes as e to the i kyy minus omega t. Right? If you expand out this dot product here, you have kxx plus kyy plus kzz. The only one that's not zero is kyy because x equals zero here and kz equals zero. So only ky and y are both non-zero. The exact same logic applies on the right-hand side. This plane wave is going to have spatial dependence at x equals zero, spatial and time dependence like e to the i qyy -Y minus omega t. Now the videos we just watched about those patterns of light and dark moving downwards like this means that this function, this little explanation for how things are happening at x equals zero, has to exactly match this expression. They've got to be the same. Otherwise we can't constantly be matching all the boundaries everywhere at all times. Comparing these two expressions and saying that these two terms must be the same immediately tells us that ky and qy have to be the same. That's a mathematical way of saying that that stripey frequency has to be the same for the left-hand wave and the right-hand wave. We can write this different mathematical ways. If you look at the geometry here, the y component of the k vector is its vertical component, and that is equal to k sine theta 1, it must be equal to q sine theta 2. And then if we pop over to the side and think about how the k vector magnitude and the refractive index are related, I'll remind you over here that the relationship between wave number and refractive index is like this, q equals n2 omega over c naught. So if I just plug in for k and for q on opposite sides of this equation, I'm going to stick it in n1 omega over c naught here, and n2 omega over c naught here. The omega over c naughts will cancel, and I can just as well write this expression as if I've substituted n1 and n2. So I end up with n1 sine theta 1 equals n2 just by balancing the way the waves intersect with the boundary and saying they've had got to intersect that way at all times, I come up with this expression, which of course we recognize as Snell's law. This is now a rigorous derivation of why Snell's law exists that you've seen ever since Optics 101 or Optics 241. By the way, 
There's one other wave that can be coming off of this boundary at this situation. You could also have a wave like this traveling away, also intersecting this boundary, and that's the reflected wave. I won't write out an expression for it, but this also does help us derive that if on the right-hand side we were writing the reflected wave instead of the transmitted wave, that would give us that sine theta 1 equals sine theta r for reflected. And of course we know that is true, that the incident and reflected waves in the same medium make the same magnitude of angle with the axis. In the next tutorial we'll talk about the mathematics of how to make the boundary conditions agree and what relationship that implies between E1's magnitude and E2's magnitude.